Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Rosie. Uh, thank you all for being here today. If this is your first time to the Springs Church, then I welcome you. Thank you, Pastor Brian, for giving me this opportunity to speak today. And at this time, I'd like to open us up in prayer. Father God, you are kind and merciful, and we thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for your never-ending faithfulness and loving kindness toward us. Jesus, we ask that you would give us revelation of you and your heart today and always. God, thank you for this opportunity. Use these words to achieve your purposes and let it all be for your glory so that we see you in all your righteousness. We glorify you, we love you, and it is in your son's name we ask and pray these things. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite scriptures is found in Psalm 66, verse 16, and it reads, Come and hear all who fear God, and I will tell of what he has done for my soul. For those of you that were here a few weeks ago, you know that I shared my story with you very briefly. Well, today I get to expand a bit more upon my story to tell you of what God has done for my soul. This morning, I'll also be talking about Destiny Rescue, an anti-trafficking organization that I will be working with in the near future and how God has used this to accomplish Romans 8.28 in my life. Well, just a little background on me. I'm 25 years old, and I was born and raised here in Las Vegas. Around the ages of seven to eight years old, I was sexually abused by my older brother, who at the time was in his early 20s. I don't remember how long this went on for, but eventually my parents found out. Immediately after finding out, my parents made my brother leave, and our, it would be years until I ever saw him again. The same evening that my parents found out what had been happening, the rest of my family and I met a local pastor who talked to my parents and I through what had happened, and a couple of weeks later, we started regularly attending his church. To my knowledge, this church initially started as a biblically sound, non-denominational Christian church, but many years later, it would end up being a cult. It was at this church that I was introduced to Christianity and the Bible for the first time. It became all I grew up knowing. I can't pinpoint the exact day or time, but I know that at some point, God became real to me, and I became aware of his presence in my life. Years later, when I was in high school, around the age of 15, the pastor of that church, by means of extreme manipulation, coercion, and grooming over time, had begun sexually abusing me. What I didn't know was that this abuse would happen for several years. No one knew, and no one suspected what was happening because I didn't tell anyone. And because it was always under the guise of me helping him with church duties. I was told that if I spoke a word to anyone of anything, I would be responsible for breaking up the church. Out of fear and intimidation, naturally, I said nothing. About a year or so into this abuse, again by way of manipulation, there came a point where I thought that I was in love with him and that we were in a consenting relationship. Keep in mind, I was still a minor, and he was in his 40s. At this point, he, wa he had me exactly where he wanted me. And through that, was able to control everything about me, starting with my physical appearance and the clothing and shoes I wore, how I ate and wore my hair, to monitoring my every move. His control and influence in my life was so great that it even included me being removed from public high school and being put into homeschool, where I was isolated from my peers. I'm sure you're wondering how he was able to get away with this. Well, earlier I mentioned that this church ended up being a cult, and a cult is defined as an instance of great respect or reverence of a person, ideal, or thing, especially as manifested by a body of admirers, often a self-appointed leader. He was able to get away with this because of how highly trusted and esteemed he was in the church. He was very intelligent, gifted, and extremely charismatic. He was elevated to the position of God, and he had no accountability. He used his gifts and God's word to manipulate and deceive every member in the church. He abused his own power and authority over others for the purposes of his own selfish gain. And sadly, as a result, he caused many to suffer. Unfortunately, I was not the only child sexually abused by the pastor in that church. A friend of mine close in age at the time was also victimized by him. 
she came forward with her story to the police, and that was the beginning of the end for him. Then began the snowball effect of girl after girl coming forward. They had also confessed that they had been abused by him. I didn't initially come forward with my report. I was questioned by family members and the police, but I lied to them all and I denied anything had happened because I was so brainwashed and deceived into thinking that I wasn't a victim. I wasn't until the extent, until finding out the extent of this abuse that my eyes were finally opened and I finally understood who this pastor really was. I realized that he was guilty of every heinous claim made against him and realized that I didn't know him at all. And once knowing the truth, I immediately filed my police report. A little over three years ago, he was finally sentenced on all of my charges. From the time that I filed my police report to the time that he got sentenced, just about six years had passed. Throughout those years, I was in a courtroom often where I had to confront and testify against my abuser, publicly recounting how he abused me repeatedly. In these courtrooms, I was also cross-examined, questioned, and in some instances even blamed for what had happened to me. After coming forward to the police, I began to sit with and understand the gravity of everything that had happened. It took me a while to understand and believe that I was actually a victim because I blamed myself. When I acknowledged that I was victimized, then came the darkest times of my life. I became extremely depressed for months. I didn't eat very often. I usually had a hard time sleeping. I hardly left my room, let alone my house. And all I could do was just cry for hours. And that's what I did. I realized that my innocence had been stolen from me. Whoever Rosie was long before any of this was long gone now. I was so bitter, hurt, and angry. The hardest part for me and what fueled my anger the most was that not only did this happen to me once, but that happened twice. And years apart from each other by someone I trusted and who I thought had my best interests in mind. I was also angry at God. How could he allow this to happen? Why didn't he intervene sooner? And was there something about me that attracted these type of men? I believed something was wrong with me. I was completely devastated and hopeless. You see, sexual abuse is very different than an outwardly physical abuse, like a punch or a cut. It's a devastating loss of oneself. Any form of sexual abuse is an evil violation. It's a violent act of power and control. Thank you. That always originates and begins inwardly at the spiritual level, and it is, is it, it is an attack on one's soul as much as it is on one's body. I absolutely hated men and wanted nothing to do with them. At this point, my family became really worried and concerned about me, but they were at a loss of how they could help me. I went to a few counseling sessions, but nothing really changed. A few of my family members started attending a local church, and a few weeks into attending, my mom brought me with her one Sunday. It was the first church I had ever been to outside of the one I grew up in, and it was a legitimate non-denominational Christian church. It was at that church that I got a taste of what a healthy church looked like, as well as discipleship and community for the first time, two gifts that God has used to transform my life since then. And after getting a taste, I craved it and began seeking it out intentionally. Although I was angry at God, I still knew that he was the only hope I had because everything, I, everything it felt as if I had come to know was a lie. I believe it was around this time that I also chose to make my faith my own. And I remember God placing a heavy passion and burden on my heart to help other girls and women who have also been sexually abused and exploited. He specifically made me aware of human trafficking and after learning more about it, I realized that I identify with many aspects of it. It was also through this church 
or through that church that I met Holly and Eric snoring. I don't know where you're at, but prior to meeting them, I had a hard time finding real Christian peers my age that could walk with me through this difficult season in my life. I had sought out and prayed for community of like-minded people for a long time, but wasn't finding it anywhere. I first met Holly at one of their teenage Bible studies one evening, and the first night I came, I poured out my whole life story to her as she listened, and that was the start of our friendship. A few weeks after this, I met her then-fiancé, Eric, and then met the couple that disciples them, Star and Earl Kennedy. Soon after this, I asked Holly to disciple me, to which she said yes, and not much longer after, Star came alongside her to disciple me as well. Neither of them had any idea of what I would put them through. (laughs) Um, It's been a long road, but one that I wouldn't trade for anything. God answered my prayers a million times over by sending me these people. I finally found the community of like-minded people that were both willing and committed to walking this life together with me, side by side. Through Holly, Eric, Star, and Earl, I met the Kairos, Colorado college mission team, and those are the same group of students that were here in March. Now I had peers that genuinely loved Jesus and pursued lives to be more like him, and they were, my, they were all my age. Kairos Las Vegas formed about a week after, and now almost six years later, all those lovely people you see me pointing to over there are them. They're all answered prayers, and they're all my family. Through God, using Kairos, I've learned so much. I've learned how to study the Bible for myself, what Christianity really looks like by seeing it lived out so well. I learned about true discipleship, and out of that knowledge, have been able to disciple others. I learned all these things by experiencing and living life with them. In the times when my past came back up like a fresh wound, and all I could do was cry, Holly and Star would cry and sit with me. They were present and consistent the times when I would have to go back to court to testify. They were praying for me. They went with me and held my hand when I was scared to see the person that hurt me. They prayed for my healing and freedom relentlessly and have walked with me on my healing journey from the beginning. I very much learned that healing is intentional and that in order to heal from the trauma I had, God would do the healing but I needed to be a willing participant in that process and face it head on in order to be truly healed from it internally. With a grateful heart, I can confidently say today that I am on the other side of that trauma, thriving and healing in the freedom that only Christ gives. With this community and family of mine, we've celebrated, encouraged, and sharpened one another. We've shared so many meals and traveled together. We've seen each other get married and have kids. We've struggled together and we've overcome together. And it is through Kairos that I experienced the love of God tangibly because the love of God now had a face to it and it was them. You'd think that after all that time, I would have been good to continue on the straight and narrow, but you see, I can be very stubborn. I'm sure my mom can testify to that. I used to brag about my stubbornness almost as if it was a badge of honor, but God eventually showed me that my stubbornness was just my pride and a refusal to bow my will to his. It was really me believing that my way was better than his. Man, that was I wrong. A few years ago, I entered into a dating relationship with someone knowing that we were unequally yoked. From the start of that relationship, it was filled with sin and did not honor God. I was fully aware of this, but I didn't want to be held accountable for my lifestyle, so very foolishly, I chose to live in disobedience to Christ and walk away from him as well as the community that he gave me. I ignored counsel, and I lived only to satisfy myself. I was so far from God and his people, yet the Holy Spirit never relented in reminding me to come back home to where he was. And this went on for about a year. When things started progressing in this relationship, I realized that I needed to make a choice. It was Jesus or him, but it couldn't be both. I kept hearing the same question replaying in my head, is a man really worth your salvation? During the entirety, entirety of that relationship, I always thought about the community of people God had put in my life. 
And I didn't realize the impact and consequences of my actions until much later, but I had hurt many people. I hurt my family, especially my mother, who advised strongly against this relationship, as well as my Kairos family. They walked with me through many of the dark times of my life, and they loved me for me. They saw the best in me when it would be years before I would ever see it in myself. And like nothing, I walked away. God showed me later that my sin that I thought was private and could keep to myself actually affected the whole body publicly because his body is one and he designed his body to be connected to one another. When I finally came to the end of myself and was finally done doing things my way, tired of being in a constant state of suffering because of the consequences of my actions, tired of the pain I felt being separated from the one who saved me, and heartbroken over the pain that caused so many people I loved. I chose to leave behind my sin and the death that came with it in exchange for life in Christ once again. As difficult as it was, I immediately ended that relationship. The many painful months following were the most humbling I'd ever experienced. God showed me the depths of my depravity and sin. My consequences were as clear as day and right away, I realized that I needed to make amends to the people that I hurt the most. <clears throat> Although they had every reason to have nothing to do with me, without a second thought, they accepted me back, and it was as if I had never left. There was no judgment, shame, or condemnation. They had told me how much they prayed for me to come back and that they'd hoped it would be sooner rather than later. And we have a saying in Kairos, and it is that to be known is to be loved. While well, they knew me, ugly parts and all, and yet they still loved me. And once again, I felt Christ's love for me through their example. And during this painful season of pruning, oddly enough, I was able to fully forgive my brother and the pastor of the church I grew up in. God also transformed my perspective of how I saw him and my past. As horrible as it was, the truth is that God allowed everything to happen the way it did for a purpose. I don't believe for a second that God wanted me or any other victims to experience what we did. But I know it was not his fault. And I know God did not do this. Selfish man did this. God did allow it, however, and I had to come to terms with that. It took me a very long time to really understand all of this, as well as the fact that God is sovereign. And even though I may not understand what happens here in this life or why things happen the way they do, I know for a fact that regardless of how dark it gets, God is not any less good and he is it, or is he any less himself? He is always good. But it took me time to surrender my definition of good to his. Coming to this knowledge was only possible by the Holy Spirit doing this work in my heart. When I thought about everything that happened, I was no longer bitter, hurt, or angry at God or at men. By the healing of power of Jesus, that resentment had completely left me. Although what happened in my past was evil and wrong in every way, the Holy Spirit revealed a powerful truth to me that enabled me to forgive my abusers. He showed me that the same hurt and pain that I suffered at the hand of my brother and that pastor because of their selfishness and sin is the same selfishness and sin that not only lives but thrives in me apart from Christ. And it's that same selfishness and sin that hurt others. When I thought of that pastor, my brother, or anyone who would abuse any person in any way, I was always looking down on them, disgusted. <clears throat> I had heard for many years that the key to freedom was forgiveness, but actually forgiving someone who has hurt you in this way wasn't easy. It wasn't until this revelation that God completely changed my perspective of him and sin. When it comes to my sin and being before a holy God, 
that pastor, my brother, and I are all on the same level at the foot of the cross. There is no hierarchy of sin. In the eyes of God, sin is sin, and all sin separates us from him. My brother's sin, it disgusts God. That pastor's sin, it disgusts God. But you know what? My sin disgusts God. And with that being said, that brings me to the most important part of the message I came to share today with those here who have not surrendered their lives to Christ. These are not my words, but this is truth that you can find for yourself in Scripture. You need to know that apart from Christ, you are under the wrath of God. You are spiritually dead, and you are an enemy of Christ. It's said often in and out of the church that we are children of God, that we're all children of God. But it's just not true. Only those who have accepted Christ as their Savior and fully surrendered their lives to him are his children, and they've been grafted in to the family of God. Apart from Christ, there is no good in any single one of us. It doesn't matter what you've accomplished or how good of a person you think you are. Romans 1, 18 through 21 reads, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Romans 6.23 reads, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The solution is not seeing how we can become better or improved versions of ourselves. We are the problem. Romans 8, 6 through 8 explains this, and it reads, For the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. I want you to know that I'm not telling you this to shame or condemn you. If I did not tell you the truth, I would not be acting in love towards you. And even if I don't know you personally, I care about your soul. I want freedom and life for you, and I want to rejoice with you eternally, as I know the rest of my brothers and sisters in Christ do too. The only true, sure, and lasting solution is Jesus Christ. And the only way to God is through Christ. John 14, 6 reads, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The solution is recognizing that God is God and we are not. God does not exist to serve or accommodate us. He is not our genie with whom we get to ask whatever we want and expect that our wishes be fulfilled. We do, not, we do not get to form our own opinion of or create our own version of God, one that's convenient for us. And God does not change based on how we feel. The truth is that God is holy and our sin separates us from him, period. And it requires a payment, a perfect sacrifice. There is hope, however. And this hope is found in the person and work of Jesus. He knew that our sin separated us from him that apart from him we were under his father's wrath, but out of great love he chose to submit himself to the will of his father and become like us in order to take on the punishment and wrath that we deserve. And we see his submission and obedience to the father through the life that he lived here on earth. And we see the atonement for our sin and God's wrath being taken upon him on the cross. Now you tell me what's fair and just. That should have been us. And that should still be us. We see the power and victory of Christ when he rose from the dead three days later. Because of his sacrifice, we now have a choice to choose life. We don't have to be separated from God any longer. 
We no longer have to be a slave to sin. We can be free from death and its power. Romans 10, 10 through 13 tells us how. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Salvation through Christ is a free gift available to any person at any moment, and through it we are restored to peace with our Creator. If after the service you've decided that you want to choose life or just want to know more about what that means, our prayer team will be up here and available to pray with you and walk you through that decision. Even after choosing, in life, even after choosing life in Christ, I don't want you to be deceived into thinking it'll be easier or things will go away. In fact, things may get a lot harder. But one thing I can promise is that with Jesus as your hope in all things, this new life in him is absolutely worth it. So last week, Rory used Romans 8.28, and I'm going to use it today because the same God who healed, restored, and made him new did the same for me. Romans 8.28 reads, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. I briefly mentioned earlier that God put a, pa a passion and a burden on my heart to help other girls and women who have been sexually abused and exploited, especially human trafficking victims. For many years, I've had a strong desire to work directly with these girls and women to come to see them know Christ personally as their savior and healer. In October of last year, one of my best friends and I took a trip to Southeast Asia for two weeks with the Christian anti-trafficking organization called Destiny Rescue. On this trip, we learned more about human trafficking and how it happens, as well as how this specific organization is working to abolish human trafficking worldwide. So many good things came out of this trip, one of which is very exciting and one that I'm here to share with you. In January of 2020, I will be a missionary serving as a caseworker for Destiny Rescue in the Dominican Republic for two years. Today is called Rescue Sunday because now I'll be talking about Destiny Rescue, the work they do, and how us as a church can rally behind them to help rescue children out of slavery as well as contribute to the fight to abolish human trafficking. Let's watch the video. Trafficking for sexual exploitation is one of the world's fastest growing crimes. Don't worry, sir, we give you good service. Millions of children are being sold for sex. Oh, she looks young. And Asia is at the epicenter of this global crisis. And this one, only this one. Oh, she's young. What is she, 14? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Many of the girls actually feel a responsibility to provide for their families and due to a lack of education and training they see that working in these establishments is a place where they feel they have to work in order to make money and provide for their families. It's tragic, you know, they put on this big happy face but they go home and they cry each night um, as they're trying to get to sleep just feeling dirty and used. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a tragic, tragic thing. Destiny Rescue is committed to finding children caught up in this tragedy. Our trained rescue agents scour brothels, bars, and streets to identify and free young lives trapped in modern day slavery. And rescue is just the first step in putting these broken lives back together. So when a girl first arrives into our care after she's been rescued, she'll be doing vocational training, life skills lessons, English studies. We have art therapy groups. We have programs that take girls through the journey of forgiveness as well. 
um, and really just sets that foundation for continued healing to take place in the future. How does this situation affect me? What did this person do to me? These girls come from brokenness, so we work towards showing them who Christ is and how much they are loved, that they are special and uniquely made, that nothing they've done in the past can stop them coming to know Him and that it's through grace and it's through the power of His love that they can be healed. Our goal is to reset damaged young lives, to release them from the bondage of traumatic pasts and send them out of our care with the skills, motivation and independence they will need to positively move forward with their lives. My hope for every child that we rescue is that they never return to the sex trade, but they get healed and they live full lives, that they find great relationships, that they get married, have a great family, and they live the destiny that God intended them to have. Your support will help us find, rescue, restore, and reintegrate thousands more children. Please consider joining with us today in our mission to turn broken young lives into beautiful young lives. So just to give you a little more background to the video you just saw, there's a few statistics I want to share surrounding human trafficking that help paint a fuller picture of this evil. At least one million children are victims of sexual exploitation. 99% of victims are female. Seven out of 10 are in the Asia Pacific region. And human trafficking is a $150 billion industry. $99 billion of that is sexual exploitation. Destiny Rescue has active projects in six countries to include Thailand, Cambodia, India, the Philippines, the Dominican Republic, and the six being an undisclosed location. And as you saw in the video, rescue is the first step in taking children directly out of exploitation and the sex trade. Undercover rescue agents go into bars, brothels, karaoke bars, clubs and massage parlors posing as Johns or clients. These rescue agents are generally former military and law enforcement members. They work with local law enforcement officials and conduct surveillance in order to conduct raids to free children. Rescue agents go into places like Nana Plaza, located in the heart of Bangkok, Thailand. This is one of Bangkok's many red light districts that I saw and briefly walked through on my trip with the, with the Destiny Rescue. In a red light district, for those who, don't, who are unaware, a red light district is an area of town or a city containing brothels, strip clubs, or many other sex businesses. Nana Plaza is a three-story outdoor plaza filled with these types of businesses, most of which have underage girls working. Pub Street is very similar to Nana Plaza, as it has many underage girls literally lined up inside and outside these businesses waiting to be put to work by the mamasans or the female pimps that operate everything. After being rescued, the girls begin the holistic restoration process. And this is where aftercare teams work to ensure children are cared for spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. As a caseworker, I'll be working in aftercare um, and will be a caseworker that will see to every one of these needs for the girls. And this next photo is a photo of a graduation that the people and I on my trip had the honor to witness when we were in Thailand. Two teenage girls were celebrated for graduating Destiny Rescue's aftercare program. They had already begun their, their healing journeys and on that day graduated with life skills with which they are able to live self-sustaining lives. These girls now have options and no longer need to resort to sex work as a means to provide for themselves and their families. And just as a side note, the girls were not permitted to be photographed by visitors for their safety, which is why you don't see them here pictured. 
The next step for Girls in Destiny Rescue's program is reintegration. Destiny Rescue provides education and employment opportunities along with caseworkers' individualized approach to set them on a path that's best suited for their needs. One skill that they can learn is jewelry making. And this was taken in their jewelry shop. And every piece you see was handmade by rescue girls. One of my favorite pieces that they make is a necklace that I'm currently wearing that has the word freedom inscribed on it. Other skills that they have the option of learning are sewing or cosmetology. When it comes to sewing, a successful jean company called Outland Denim has partnered with Destiny Rescue to employ rescued girls. They take into account each girl's situation, as many of them have families of their own to support, and compensates them fairly. They will start them out well above the minimum wage in their country and increase from there. The great part and what is so empowering for these girls is that they actually get to take home their own paychecks. Girls also have the option of working in one of the cafes owned by Destiny Rescue, where they learn how to wait on people in a restaurant type setting, take orders, cook, clean, and handle money. We had several meals at their cafes in Thailand and Cambodia. And this cafe you see pictured in Thailand is actually completely managed and run by a woman that was rescued out of sex trafficking. Destiny Rescue also works diligently in the area of prevention. They use education, awareness, and specialized programs to protect children that are at risk from ever being exploited. This next picture is a hill tribe prevention village in Thailand, located at the very top of a mountain away from the city. Children in villages like these, in particular, are at high risk of becoming trafficked because they are not citizens and don't have many rights, if any. This forces them to make money to provide for their families however they can, usually under the table and in places like Pub Street and Nana Plaza, the ones that you saw earlier. And sadly, more often than not, this heavy responsibility to provide for their families falls on the girls. This next photo is another prevention village that we visited. The kids and teens you see here are also at risk and vulnerable. Many of them have siblings or parents that were trafficked and are at high risk of being trafficked themselves. Destiny Rescue steps in and intervenes before that can happen. And in this picture, you can see a couple teenage girls with guitars. Um, when we were there, we were hanging out with the kids, playing with them, and they started pulling out their guitars and doing worship. And they sang in Thai while we were singing in English, and it was a beautiful thing to be a part of because it was a little taste of heaven. Psalm 82, verses 3 through 4, reads, Gives justice to the poor and the orphan. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Rescue the poor and helpless. Deliver them from the grasp of evil people. This is a call to take action on behalf of those who are oppressed and helpless. So how can you help and what can you do? Well, the first and most important step you can take is to pray. Pray for the children being rescued. Pray for the people going out to rescue them. And pray for the people who will walk with them through their healing journeys. Other ways that you can take action include being a rescue partner. You can help rescue a child every month, and your monthly gift of any amount will help to rescue and restore children from sexual exploitation. You can take this information to other churches and host a rescue Sunday, just like the one today. You can also fundraise for freedom. You can do it by yourself, or you can gather some friends together and host an event. Or you can fundraise other ways, like through Facebook online, 
or you can host a jewelry party where Destiny Rescue will send you handmade jewelry and all the proceeds of your sales will go back to the girls who made that jewelry. You can also go on a team trip to become more educated about human trafficking and you can bring that awareness to your own sphere of influence. If you grabbed a pamphlet or bulletin on your way in, there's a link to Destiny Rescue's website. If you go to their website and under the link, get involved, you'll see different ways on how you can help set her free. In addition to the different ways you can help rescue her, supporting me financially during my time in the Dominican Republic is another way you can do that, as this is a volunteer position and not paid. In addition to my personal savings, I'm raising funds and have a total goal of 28,000 for two years. Those funds will cover my housing, food, transportation, health care, and other day-to-day -day expenses. I'm currently having my, pro my paperwork processed and we'll have a link in the near future where you can donate online if you feel so led to. <clears throat> I'd like to start wrapping things up with addressing my brothers and sisters in Christ. I am being called to serve abroad, but I know God isn't calling everyone to do that. I do know that he has called all of us to fulfill the Great Commission of making disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe and obey everything that God has commanded, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I ask you, how are you fulfilling this commission? And if you're not, what is stopping you, and will you be obedient? If you don't know what that looks like, begin with discipleship and community. Seek it out. And if you can't find it, then create it yourself. Start and serve somewhere. Serve anywhere there is a need, even if that means it's not your specific gifting, and even if you're uncomfortable. Share your own story of redemption with others. We were bought at a price. Our lives in Christ are no longer our own, and neither are our stories. Let's live in the freedom and newness of life that we've been given in Christ. And let's not shrink back from that. And for those who have not put their faith in Christ and completely surrender their lives to him, but desire to be at peace with and in a personal relationship, a right relationship with their creator, I invite you to say this prayer with me, but don't just say this prayer and expect everything to go away. You must now put action to your faith. After service, come talk to a member of the prayer team and have them pray over you. Ask them about discipleship and community and how you can get plugged in. Let's pray this prayer together. Father God, I acknowledge and confess to you that I am a sinner. I recognize and confess that you are God and I am not. I ask for forgiveness for my sin that has separated me from you my whole life. Jesus, I believe that you humbled yourself and lived life as a human just like me. I believe you died on the cross to take upon yourself the wrath that I deserve. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later, showing your power and victory over death and darkness. I relinquish all control I thought I had and choose life in you instead, trusting that you know better than me and that you are good. I now acknowledge you as Lord of my life. I put all of my trust and faith in you alone. Thank you for your great love for me. Help me to live a life that pleases you. It is in your name I pray, amen.